How did a poor family living in Victorian London earn enough money to survive, to buy bread and keep a roof over their head? The short answer is that to pay their way in life, they sold their souls for work. Long hours of hard toil for an income so miserable that, to avoid being left penniless, several people often lived and worked together to pay the rent. This wasn't a choice. These were people victim to a world where the only social support for the sick and unemployed was charity or the goodwill of family. And many, in hard times, found neither. If your wages were insufficient to feed yourself and pay for your lodgings, you faced a stark choice. Work all the hours of the day or turn to crime and prostitution. Many worked sometimes dangerous work, and worked their bodies into a pauper's coffin, such that their souls might find rest not granted to their bodies in life. Today, you will hear an account by a Victorian journalist concerned with the suffering of the working poor. She resolved to do more than give her audience second-hand reports of life in London's hovels and garrets, but actually went to live and work amongst them, to better understand and report on the terrible plight of the working class. You will discover how women toiled to make sacks from morning to night using a sharp and dangerous hand tool that could wound and disable a worker. Find out how this heavy, ceaseless and poverty-inducing work left women trapped in a life that would end only in the workhouse and the grave. A life so miserable that it was relieved by one thing only. Gin. Before we move on, if you're interested in history like this, and you want to find out more about what life was really like for people in the past, please consider subscribing for more content. If you'd like to support what we make for you, check out the description for links to ways you can help us to continue bringing the past alive. We all know that there are various degrees of poverty as there are various degrees of riches. The artisan who makes his one pound a week and on it keeps a wife and family is in good circumstances, compared with the clerk on his 25 shilling salary, who, though unmarried, has to keep a decent coat on his back and soon loses his footing of respectability if he fails in regard to appearance. But poverty griping and hard begins when wages are on a sliding scale and work is precarious from one job to another. By penniless poor, I mean emphatically those who, though they work 10, 12 and even 14 hours a day, cannot make enough to more than keep body and soul together, and never will. Therein lies the hopelessness and the helplessness of it, for it is those out of work that kind-hearted people help, not those in, who meekly and mutely are staggering to their graves. This is the class that interests me, and to enlist people's sympathy in their behalf, I resolve to go and live among them, and practically test what they have to endure. Casting about for a means to fulfil my plan, I came across an old woman who told me she was a Pam worker. So was her daughter. But that work was so slack she feared she would not be able to keep the two rooms which housed the family consisting of six persons. I had never heard of Pam working, but I asked if she would take me as an indoor apprentice and I would help with the rent. No doubt she thought I was strange, but times were too bad for her to be critical, and on my paying three shillings in advance, it was agreed I should arrive the next evening at her domicile with my belongings. They lived in a narrow alley down a dim passage. Their neighbours were bird fanciers, fruit vendors, and street hawkers of every description. The houses were tall, dingy and tumble down. She dwelt at the top of the tallest, dingiest, and most tumble down in appearance. It was a hot summer's night when I entered the court, which was crowded with pale-faced, barefooted children and rough, untidy girls. The air was noisome, and the very animals cooped up in their tight little cages were sick with heat. Up the rickety dark staircase I went, bearing my blue cotton bundle. Gran welcomed me cordially, and had kept some tea stewing on the hob. Her daughter Hannah eyed me suspiciously, and had rather a sullen expression. 
She was a woman about thirty-five, very far gone in consumption, tuberculosis. Her husband, Jim, was smoking on a bed in a corner. He was paralysed on one side and would never do any work again. The three children, girls between nine and fifteen, looked hearty and happy enough, as I often noticed the children of the poor do, up to a certain age. They had stayed in, in honour of the visitor, Gran told me, and with them I soon made friends. The furniture consisted of a table, a broken leather chair, a chest of drawers, and a fixture which held the crockery. Some old wooden boxes did duty for seats, and a sack held a little coal dust. There was a playful young kitten darting about the floor, and a bulldog in the last stage of old age lay curled up by the side of the man. Pictures were in plenty, in frames and out of frames, pinned up along the wall, and I was pleased to see a very neat print of Christ blessing little children, which one of the girls had received as a prize. The other room, where I was to sleep, was smaller, and at the back, my shakedown, a crude makeshift bed, was behind the door, and another lay under the window, where Hannah and the two elder children reposed. The jug and basin were on the floor, and the towel was on a peg, which also held a bonnet and shawl. The place was clean enough, but, oh, so bare. The next morning we commenced work. Gran called us at 5 a.m. We had tea with condensed milk for breakfast and some dry bread. The employment I found to be making sacks, tents, etc. Of course, strong canvas. The palm thimble, from which the work takes its name, is a curious-looking object. The top part is of lead, a good deal larger than the usual sort of thimble. It is placed in the centre of a flat piece of leather. Then it is fastened by means of a strap to the palm of the worker's hand, the lead being exactly in the middle of the palm. This enables the worker to use all her strength in pressing the needle into the material. I knew little what I was in for when I entered my apprenticeship. The work has to be done standing and is really very dangerous. If the needle slips, it goes into your flesh and makes a deep and painful wound. Sometimes a worker is disabled for two or three weeks together. Personally, I was so afraid of my weapon that I used it most gingerly, and, though getting but slight scars, I never made more than six and a half pence a day. Gran could make a sack in a little over two hours. We were paid forty-four pence a sack, so by keeping at it for twelve hours she could make two shillings threepence in the day. And so she did, poor old soul, whenever she could get the job. Her perseverance was beyond all praise. She never stopped for a midday meal, but would peg away at a bottle by her side, containing cold tea, flavoured with gin. This kept her up, she said. Staunchly, dauntlessly, she sewed away till the sweat ran down her face, and when she paused, her hands trembled as if she had the palsy. At fever heat she went on and on, talking little, but bending her old frame back and fro with the regularity of a machine. Between three and four, her strength was spent, and she would take some rest, nodding over a short black pipe. But a meal of tripe, cow or sheep stomach, and onions, or bloaters, smoked herring, or potatoes fried in fat, accompanied by some more tea and some more gin, put her on her feet again, and she resumed her task till the twelve hours' work was an accomplished fact. Hannah's health prevented her from earning so much. When a fit of coughing came on, she had to throw herself on her bed and lie quiet till it was over. I have known her drop down in a faint at her work. They would just sprinkle some water over her, and when she came to, would let her go on again. It was a good week if she earned ten shillings. Six shillings or seven shillings was the average. Sometimes she would crawl out to the dispensary and get a cough mixture, and occasionally she would go to the outpatient department of the hospital. 
but she sorely grudged the time, and did not believe in their ability to cure her. The poor are dreadful fatalists, and when they are ill accepted as something inevitable. Indeed, where is the strength to come from to make an effort? The eldest girl also helped at palm-working, but her share was necessarily fitful, for she attended to her father, did the cooking, the shopping, and kept her younger sisters tidy. She also was valuable in taking the sacks backwards and forwards. They are terribly heavy, whether you carry them on your head or on your hip. I went with her once, and am not ashamed to own I had to turn back. The load is unfit for any girl. Ada Ann was bright and bonny, and it seemed a pity, after a good Christian education, to condemn her to a life where she could never make more than twelve shillings and sixpence a week. But she took to it as a matter of course, and they could not see why she should not. They were too worn out, too weary even to think. The dull mechanical round of work blunted their brains. The pressure of paying the rent, seven shillings and sixpence, and finding bread, darkened their faculties. And they drudged on ploddingly and patiently, like very beasts of burden. They evoked no sympathy, for they were not much better off than their neighbours. They had work generally, so if they ventured to complain, they were called expecting. And yet, they were always hungry, short of fire in the winter, and with nothing in the world to look forward to but the workhouse as the end. It is pitiful in its very dreariness, and perhaps the strongest touch of pathos was... They saw nothing in it themselves. On Sundays they generally slept, ate, drank, and slept again. They liked me to tell them Bible tales, and the man would read whatever I gave him. But as to attending church, Ada Ann says, Why, miss, I have too much family pride. To worship in a frock that cost three halfpence a yard would put me to shame indeed and the younger ones washed their clothes on Sunday to be decent for school next day. The redeeming feature was their goodness to each other. I shall never forget, one damp, drizzling night, how a woman with a child of five in her arms pushed open the door, and, sitting down on the leather chair, said quietly, So, mother, I have come back. Tis it you, Liza? asks the old woman, just looking up from her work. We were slaving by lamplight. The man was dozing, and Hannah had gone for some medicine. Yes, mother, she repeated. It's Liza again. No other word was spoken. The old woman continued her sewing. The younger sat still in the chair. Presently Hannah returned. Tis Liza, remarked Gran, with a nod in her direction. "'Tis it you, Liza?' asked Hannah, taking off her wet bonnet and shawl. "'Yes, Hannah, it's me,' was the reply, a little wearily, and that was all. What tragedy her coming covered I never knew. Her return was accepted with passivity. She shared their board and lodging, and was grudged nothing. She and her child slept in my room, and Hannah did vouchsafe to say to me the first morning after her arrival, Liza's out of work, so she'll stay with us a bit. She thinks her boy is sickening for fever, and wants a bit of nursing. Ought he not go to the hospital? I exclaimed. What's the good? she said laconically, till we know what's the matter. Maybe he's only light-headed from starvation. Still, under the circumstances... I thought my room was preferable to my company, and, having got a charitable lady to befriend them, I gratefully took my departure. <laughs>